Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 19 of Night Call. After a little low of motivation, I am back and ready to finish this. Although, if I take a look at the views, it seems like not a lot of people are waiting for me to continue to play it. But still, I started it, I'm gonna end it. What are we gonna do today? What are we starting with? There's two points of interest that I still have to go to. I think most of the people I know already. Although no, we don't know him, so let's drive him. He looks like a politician or something. Vincent Bourlier, I need a man I can trust. What? I'm just a taxi driver. The man getting in your cab seems anxious. You've seen these types before, late for a meeting, late to catch a plane, late getting home. He gives you an address in the 15 arrondissement. You recognize him, a former deputy or senator. Oh, I was right. Something like that. He looks like a politician. He looks at you nervously in the mirror. He's upset about something. Everything all right, sir? It's always good to ask. Yes, fine. Thank you. His eyes are watering. He runs a hand across his damp forehead. He's sweating a great deal for a winter night. Oh. He clears his throat. Do a... Excuse me, I was wondering. Yes. Do people ever leave things in your taxi? Um, that's a strange thing to ask. All the time. Yeah, like phone numbers. Ah, huh, all the time. That's good to know. Like, did he... Mm, did he leave something? in a taxi before. He pauses and attempts to pull himself together. He looks cramped in his suit. What do you do with the things people forget? Do you keep them? What are you trying to insinuate there? We take them back to the central office and wait for someone to claim them. Oh shit. I mean, fine. Very good. How civil of you. Good job. Oh yeah, okay. He lost something in a taxi. He pauses again. Do you need anything? Shall we drive there? <laughs> well, yes, no. How shall I say? I need to lose something if you get my drift. What? I'm not gonna be a part of that. I've already been to prison once. I need to lose it in your taxi. That is a very strange way to put the sentence. <laughs> I don't understand. Sorry, I, I owe you an explanation. I just got out of a meeting. It was awful. Sighing to himself, he adds. Awful. I've always been loyal to the party, you know. I've always followed orders, gotten the job done. Oh, he's planning to drop information. My mother was a card-carrying member, my father an elected official, but I just can't do it anymore. I'm going to leave my briefcase here on the back seat. A moment goes by, he stares at you. You might say it was an oversight, you see. And then what happens? And then, then someone will take care of the briefcase. When you drop the taxi off, bring the briefcase to the head office. Someone will come pick it up. He takes a deep breath. This country we live in? It's going to hell in a handbasket. Everyone running and is corrupt. They've sold out, they're thieves, all of them. He slowly lays the briefcase beside him. We have lunch with lobbyists, dinner with bankers. We should burn everything, start over from scratch. Sometimes I dream we'll all get sick, be swept away by a political plague. A flu for suits. <coughs> Pauses, exhales, shakes. I can't bear to see them spend 600 euros on a meal when they just decided to close a hospital that suddenly became too costly to maintain. Six months ago, we refused to vote for a law that would have prevented the building in Pantin from burning down. Do you remember? Six months ago, we could have saved 75 people. He stumbles over the next words. Public housing minister, when we presented that bastard with the bill, he burst out laughing. As if the people living in those crumbling buildings were just peons. Passenger groans of it in pain and suddenly stops talking. 
What are you going to do now? I'm not gonna ask what's in it for me, come on. I'm going to sleep. Are you? No, you're not committing suicide, are you? Then they'll send me to prison. Or worse, to a far off ward. Some overseas territory. Guyana or something like that. He struggles to swallow. That's what they do to traitors. He anticipates being caught. And I don't know, why would he just do it like this obvious? Like losing his whole suitcase. Why wouldn't he just tip journalists off an anonymously or something like that? That's possible, right? After that, we'll see. Tomorrow is another day, if you know what I mean. Silence. Stop the car. Act as if everything is normal. You park along a sidewalk. You suddenly notice your client smells terrible, sour, pungent, B.O., almost unbearable. He pays his fare and slips you an extra bill. Your compensation. He gets out and walks away quickly without turning back. You open the window to air out the cab. Ah, oh, well, that is a fair amount of compensation you gave me there, thank you. It is highly appreciated. Ooh, it's right around the corner, that's nice. Oh no, it's the escort service that the uh, homeless guy worked at. I don't know. The headquarters of Secret Escort Paris is a rather rustic looking affair wedged between two buildings. Two stories, wooden shutters, dead flowers in the window boxes, no doubt zapped by the cold. There is a light and on downstairs. You're not exactly sure what the plan is. Maybe a banknote or two will get you some answers. You climb out of the cab. Well, luckily we just made some extra money. You enter the building through a door opening directly onto an office. It's probably what the whole house is like. Rooms converted into meeting rooms and archives. But it's the temperature that really surprises you. It's practically colder inside than out. Hmm, comfy. Can I help you? A young man, oh, that's a man. Cammy, I thought that was a woman's name. A young man wearing a parka, boots and mittens enters the room. He gives you a thorough looking over, then visibly brightens. Ah, at last, the heating man. Tell me you're here to fix the heat. No, I'm not. Oh, I see. How can I help you? I'm looking for one of your customers. Wasn't he working for them? I mean, if I'm asking for a customer, they probably are likely to block because of, like, privacy or something. I'm just gonna ask a few questions. Questions? If you have any questions, you can visit our site. It's all explained there. We just do the paperwork here. His voice takes on deeper, more confident tones. You can sense he's used to visits like these. And I think you'd better turn around now and leave before I call the police. You take another step backwards. He goes over to the desk and opens a drawer. You're not sure whether he's going to pull out a gun or press an alarm. Maybe we can work something out? Yeah, let's bribe him. Whatever. He's not going to buy it. I've got three seconds to get out of here. Hmm. You spin on your heel and message received. Back in the taxi, you let out an annoyed whistle, then start the engine. For a moment, you sit there, perfectly still, disappointed, then you decide to get on with your shift. The investigation isn't over, after all. Okay, that didn't go so well. Oh, hey, it's Miriam again. But I want to meet him. Who's he? I think we've seen Miriam enough now. Jérôme Pro. Passenger hurls himself into the back of the cab, spits out his address, and loosens up all at once, as if relieved. I thought, phew, thank you for stopping. You nod and start the cab. You sense he's a talker and a real headache. It's better to focus on road. Oh. He drums his fingers nervously on his leather briefcase, but he's wearing a satisfied look on his face. Barely 30 seconds later, your passenger asks with a slight tremor. Are we almost there yet? You look at him in the rearview mirror, surprised and a little annoyed. Usually it's the big brawny types who say stuff like that, guys who think they're bulls in a cash cow world. But this guy, he looks more like a lamb to you. We just got going. He seems disappointed. Oh, right. Not a problem, not a problem. His fingers start rat-a-tatting again. That's when you notice the blood dripping slowly down his arm. He's wearing a dark-colored jacket and you hadn't spotted it right away. 
Your passenger doesn't seem to be in any pain, though. He's staring out the window religiously. You watch him intently, trying to figure out what's going on in his head. You're bleeding. He stares at you for a moment, not sure if he's heard you correctly, then his face brightens. Yes, I'm fine. He rewards you with a grateful smile. <laughs> that is an interesting smile. The building manager didn't know I was coming by. So he sicked the dogs on me. What? He got bitten by a dog? A faint smile flickers across his face, but he suddenly looks pale to you. Unfortunate business. I had sent a message to his wife, of course, but she had broken her leg that morning. So she forgot to tell the husband. Well, she didn't exactly break it. The cab did, the one I had ordered to go into the office. It ran over her. What? What story is that? Because, you see... Uh, wait, I'm getting it all wrong. I had already gone in that morning, but I forgot the key to the safe. That is to say... Well, it's pretty complicated, actually. It gives a short love. I dropped the key and it got stuck in the gearbox of my car. He stops. Is that supposed to happen? Not my car, actually, but an old jalopy on loan from the garage. Because my real car, so to speak, broke down on my way to Paris yesterday. I was just back from a friend's funeral in Brest, a tragic death, gas leak in a chalet we shared in the Alps. He heaves an audibly woeful sigh. Is he a murderer too? So now I have two cars in a garage. He appears to be momentarily preoccupied. Not exactly the best timing. He gives his briefcase a knowing pat as if it contained the launch codes for the US nuclear arsenal. But these papers are pretty darn important. Clearly he's very impressed with himself. I work for father and it was an emergency. An emergency that lasted all day? Well, yes, it did take two days, what with the breakdown on the highway, then the flood in the first garage, the key stuck in the gearbox of the car on loan, the accident with the caretaker's wife, the day at the hospital, the traffic jams on the way back. He swallows audibly. The dogs. He heaves a deep sigh. And then the fire alarm went off in father's office. Just between you and me, I have doubts about the Picasso drying out, but I haven't had time to look into it. <laughs> he drops his head for a moment before adding. But father says we shouldn't talk about the Picasso. He looks at you, his voice brightens noticeably. Quite a day, uh, especially since the papers were not in the safe. They were in the trash. His eyes widen. It's crazy how big that building is. There are tunnels in the basement and dumpsters the size of this cab. He bites his lip. Not that your cab is a dumpster, I mean, don't get me wrong. But we often forget we live on an anthill. The garbage bins and pipes, the sewers. Not that I'm likely to forget the sewers anytime soon. I've actually visited them a few times, up close and personal. Did you know that one out of every 37 manhole covers in Paris is a manufacturing defect? Oh, wow. <laughs> Okay, so I think he's followed by bad luck, but this is a pretty bizarre character. Just imagine, huh? Uh, no. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, if you step on one, your foot firmly on the edge, the lid flips over and you fall in. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> all the time. It's pretty crazy. You're nearing your destination. Your passenger seems increasingly excited. Oh, I want to drive him forever. He's so much fun. <laughs> you wouldn't happen to be unlucky. Your passenger's eyes open wide. Me? Unlucky? He nods his head. Funny you ask. People ask me that all the time. I don't think so. I've had a few accidents, of course, like everyone else in life, I guess. But unlucky? No. I don't believe in stuff like that. I think you have to concentrate to focus on your work, on your life. That we have to forge ahead, come what may. Even if your fiancé leaves you for the priest the day of your wedding. Wow! Oh my god, the poor guy. I know that's not, not really like the same, but the whole style, the whole vibe of him reminds me so much of Yusuke from Persona 5. He raises a warning finger. And before you ask, no, it's not bad luck, it's a beautiful love story. <laughs> 
Um, okay. I am happy for her. He pauses. And for him, of course. The priest. He manages a forest smile. Ah, oh, <laughs> he's so much like Yusuke somehow. You park in front of the address he had given you. A large house manian building. House manian building? Okay. Clearly home to a host of lawyers and notaries. Oh wow, I definitely wouldn't want him as a lawyer. Well, I'm off. We still have a few hours to get father's defense ready. Oh no, he is a lawyer. Soon he'll be free. I know it. I can feel it. He pays the fare and exits the cabin in a hurry. You watch your passenger approach the door, punch in the code, punch it in again, get impatient. Then start walking away from the building. <laughs> um, honk? You give a honk and your passenger walks over to the cab. It's funny, I can't get in. What street number do I give you? 112. Oh right, it's 212 actually. It's still a ways away, climb on in. Oh, I love him, I want to drive him forever. Thank you. He climbs into the back seat. Sorry, I'm not very good with numbers. What do you do for a living? I'm an accountant. <laughs> of course he is. You start the cab and enjoy only a few seconds of silence. No, I want him to keep talking forever. You've almost come to number 212. A firefighter decked out in protective gear motions you to stop. Oh no, he burned down the building. Your passenger leans forward. What's going on? That's the address. Out the window you see an elegant apartment building in flames. A half dozen emergency vehicles are blocking the street. A uh, fire. A 212. Your passenger is rummaging through his pockets in a tizzy. He goes pale. Damn, damn, damn. I, I have to go. Thank you for your help. He leaps out of the taxi and dashes over to the firefighters. His briefcase clutched tightly against his chest. You start the cab. Uh, he was fun. We know Santa, but we don't know him, so let's go there. At least I think it's a him. It's hard to tell. It's a girl! Amelia Schoendorfer, I need help. Yeah, don't you all. The next passenger getting in your cab is chilled to the bone. Would you mind? You turn up the heat immediately. Thank you. Her teeth are chattering. She looks like she's at the end of her rope. Thank you. I've been wandering around in the woods for three hours. She looks at you. I'm not a... Uh, you're not a what? She mumbles an almost inaudible thanks, shuts her eyes for a second and enjoys the warmth. Where to? N nowhere. Uh, here, actually. I need your help, if you're willing. You lean over to her. Uh, if I can be of help? Uh, yes, I think... I lost my cat. Another cat, or is it Kruki? He ran off into the woods. Would you mind helping me look for him? You nod. I'll look left and you're right. You start to drive very slowly. Oh, we should be able to hear him. He's uh, wounded. She opens the window. A gust of icy cold air fills the cab. Wounded? Yes, he broke his paw a few weeks ago and I came out here so he could stretch his legs a bit. Why are you supposed to do that? But he got scared and ran away. Surprising, because he knows the place. She flashes you a smile. Um, what's his name? The young lady freezes. His name is... Vincent, like the woods. Since that's where I found him. Ah, she looks away. You've been doing this job for a while? A few years now. Nice, okay. But I'm not really experienced in cat watching. I'm... I drove them to the train station once, but that's about it. For several minutes, silence fills the cab. From time to time, she sticks her head out the window and calls her cat. Pity! Pity, pity, pity! She catches you looking at her in the rearview mirror and looks back out the window. Vincenzo! Vincenzo! I don't know French. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation. A rather unusual name. Yes, yeah, she just told us why. Say nothing. Stare at her. Say nothing. Say some time passes and you can tell your passenger is uncomfortable, almost as if she felt cramped in the back seat. 
She avoids your gaze and you avoid looking at her. She abruptly hits the seat next to her. Okay, fine. I, I must confess something. It's not exactly my cat. Whose cat is it then? <gasps> Did you steal a cat? She smirks. It... Uh, I'm sure it belongs to her boyfriend or something. Oh, no. I'm a vet student and the cat is from the lab at school. Oh, it escaped. And if I don't find it, I'll get a really bad grade. And, and I have to repeat a year. And if I have to repeat a year, my parents won't pay for school anymore. See, my mother and father are very reputable veterinarians. I can't let them down. <laughs> Say nothing and stare at her. Uh, we'll find him, hopefully. She lowers her gaze, her voice is soft and muffled. Uh, thank you. From the bottom of my heart. So she lied of where to find him, of where she found her cat? What was so bad about the truth? It would be strange if she would have told us that she stole a cat, but... This kind of thing never happens. Usually the cats are... She cuts her sentence short and looks outside. Mm, I thought I saw something. You keep driving. You've never driven this slowly in the Bois de Vincennes. From the time to time, your passenger looks like she's seen or heard something. She hits the seat abruptly. Over there, I can hear him. You stop the taxi, the tires squeal softly on the gravel. Your passenger runs off into the night. You wait for her for a second and begin to hear the cat's cries. The meows are harrowing, painful. Your passenger reappears without the cat. What's going on? She's obviously in shock. Staring ahead into nothingness. I can't. It's, it's terrible. It's happening. The cat was... She finally shuts her eyes and catches her breath. We were in the middle of dissecting cat. the cats when this one woke up and ran away. He's half open. Whoa! This is horrible on so many levels. They were dissecting a cat that was supposed to be dead but wasn't. Who checked this? Whoever checked if this cat was dead shouldn't be a veterinarian then. She lowers her head so you can see her tears. I can't leave him like that, but I can't bring him back. He's suffering too much. Her hands, her, her hands are shaking. The meowing in the distance curls your blood. You have to take care of this. Yeah, I mean, you can let him suffer now. Go. I don't know. I can't. No, you have to. Go there. I just can't. It's dying all alone. It's then be there for it. Oh. You cannot stay quiet listening to cat meowing to death. There aren't exactly a thousand solutions. She raises her head. I know. I... No, I'm not gonna do your job. I'm not gonna go to kill a cat. You do it. You're the veterinarian to be. I'll wait for you here. She snaps harshly back into reality. I have to do this. We're not allowed to operate on life animals. I... I broke the rules, I... Her sentence fades out. I'm going to do this. Yes, do it! F for fuck's sake, she gets out of the cab. The door slams, her footsteps squeak on the gravel. Then on the grass. Even with your headlights on, you can see anything that's happening. The cat meows one last time. Time passes and your passenger returns. She gets into the back seat. She looks petrified. You turn the key in the ignition. You start driving, your passenger is, squeak, is speaking, but her voice sounds so far away. I live on Rue de la Contoscap. You nod. A few minutes later, you leave the Bois de Vincennes. The city goes by, you feel like it's only just been built, just settled in. You're shaking a little. In the back seat, your passenger starts to sob. I I'm so sorry. If I'd known, I wouldn't have... I'm gonna say nothing. I don't have to say anything for her. If I don't pass this year, I'm in deep shit. I'll have to repeat, be with second year students all over again. That's the only thing you're worrying about right now? I let one of the lab assistants help me. He's kind of sketchy. He brought the cat to me and told me it was dead. Hmm. He should have double checked. I mean, yeah, how hard could it be? Uh, miss? No, I, I actually don't want her. I don't know if miss means that I'm going to tell her that I don't know that it's not her fault or everything will be okay. I don't want to do that. She, sh 
She starts speaking a bit faster. I saw it was still breathing when I started opening up. What? And the guy told me to keep going. What are you? No. Okay, seriously, you shouldn't be a veterinarian at all. What the hell? That's when the cat jumped off the table, slipped out the window, out. She shakes her head. Who left the window open while operating? Okay, dissecting, whatever. Call me an asshole, but I don't want to make her feel better about this because this is. She just screwed up major. No. Keep going. Go. I don't know. I don't care. I don't know if it was a joke, some sort of hazing, or just some twisted trick, but I, I'm going to file a complaint. What? I don't know how I could go back to school and see that guy again. What if he filmed the whole thing? He's going to tell everyone about it. Um, she's an aspiring veterinarian and she keeps going to dissect a live animal because a lab assistant tells her to? Ugh, I'll be a laughing stock. It's the kind of reputation that sticks with you. I kind of think you deserve that, though. Her voice gets squeaky. Forever. She leans towards you slightly. You won't tell anyone, will you? You stare right at her. You're not far from your destination now. You want nothing more than to smoke a cigarette, forget all this, move on. Your voice immediately betrays how tired you are. You're responsible. Yeah, she is. She is responsible. What's done is done. You're responsible for it. I don't know if I can manage to live with this. You can. Your words are aggressive and hard. She stares at you and says, Perhaps. Perhaps you're right. She looks at the road going by. I haven't really accepted responsibility, actually. Her voice slowly fades. I know that. She suddenly shakes her head and looks at you strangely. You've seen that expression before, big eyes and raised eyebrows. Who are you exactly? But she doesn't ask the question. She settles for silence. Silence fills the cab again. You keep driving in silence, paying no attention to the movements in the back seat. When you pull up to the address she gave you, she pays her fare without another word. She opens the door and gets out of the taxi. After a few meters, she freezes. Everything okay? She almost jumps when she hears your voice and walks towards her building. Five seconds go by, slowly, before she hurries, head bowed, towards the building. She disappears behind a large wooden door. You suppose she lives in one of the old maid's chambers on the top floor. <sighs> no tip for that I just helped you find your cat? Oof. Let's do him, he's close by. Maybe he's got something new to tell us. Or is he going to the airport again? Yeah, okay, he's going to the airport. You know what, I'm gonna tell him he's a total asshole. I think I didn't do that in the first one. Sorry. It's no way to treat other people. We're talking about scoring here, no need to get all worked up. It's not like anyone died or anything. There is a slight tremor in his voice. If they don't want to give me their number, they don't give me their number. I never insist. A lot of guys do stuff that is a lot worse, right? So enough of the feminist bullshit theory. Cap pulls up to the drop-off point. Your passenger pays the fare in a hurry. Yeah, but still, I mean, all you do is... Uh, to be perfectly honest, you shouldn't talk to your passengers like that. His voice takes on an unpleasant whining tone. It's not very professional. If I had an ab, I'd give you a bad rating. He squares his shoulders and is about to walk off. You should wash your cap too. It smells like shit. He walks away. Under the sole of his right shoe, you catch sight of a dark brown spot. The passenger disappears into the airport. You roll down the backseat window and start up the cab. Maybe it was you. Who's next? Oh wait, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna drive there. Ooh, map is going crazy. You pull up in front of the cemetery where you picked up Alexandre Leclerc. He's been speaking to a man at the time, the caretaker. Maybe he will be able to help you. One of the windows in the small house next to the cemetery is lit up. Go knock on the door. 
You exit the cab and cross the street. There's the house, mere yards from the cemetery entrance. The massive iron gates probably stop the corpses from clearing the hell out of there. <laughs> you walk up to the door and knock. A few seconds later, the cemetery caretaker appears. You barely saw him the night you picked up your customer. The guy is well over six feet tall and must weigh in over 200 pounds easy. 200 pounds of muscle and the rest a thick, bushy mustache. Next to him, you're a real featherweight. Well... Uh, sorry to bother you. There's something I'd like to talk to you about. What about? Alexandre Leclerc? You decide to play it straight. Alexandre. He steps aside and you catch the sight of a pair of slippers with dog heads, big sad eyes, furry muscles, ears dragging over dirty tiles. A common sight will be more comfortable. Okay, please don't kill me. Follow your host inside the house. The place with its furnishing and decorations from a bygone era seems to be stuck in a time warp until you catch sight of a collection of state-of-the-art knives on the wall opposite the door, that is. Oh, I'm gonna die. Character motions for you to follow him into the kitchen where you are greeted by a bowl of chicory coffee and a formica table. If you'd like something to drink, chicory coffee is all I have. You've never really known what chicory coffee is, you politely decline. <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. I also don't know what chicory coffee is. I think we found it in a wee happy few, but... I don't know about it. He sits down with a shrug, cuts a large slice of runny cheese and deposits it on a slice of bread. You watch him dip the bread and cheese into the chicory. Your appetite gone for good. Ew! Okay, pal, so what's up with Alexandra? Do you know him well? Maybe. All depends on what you want to talk about, pal. He takes up his bowl in an enormous hand, swishing its contents to get all the crumbs. He makes you feel comfortable, so do the knives hanging on the wall by the entrance. I'm helping his daughter? I guess, because I just want to ask a few questions is also a little bit suspicious maybe? Yeah. His daughter. That's right, she's been worried about him since the fire. Caretaker lowers his gaze, he'd been staring you straight in the eye since the start of the interview. She's a good girl, so they say. What's it to a taxi driver, if that's what you really are? I'm a driver, but I help people too. I'm a taxi driver, but I help people too. It's... I help out some of the people in the neighborhood. He looks back up, a smile appearing from the depths of his thick mustache. I do that too. Whew! For a little moment I thought he would grab the knives and stab me. From the way he looks at you, you can tell the caretaker likes you. Yet he seems somewhat wary as well. Alexander, he's a good guy. I know him for ages. We went to some demonstrations together a few years ago. He used to work at another building owned by Group Diamant, you know, the bigwigs who ran the Albatross. Well, they sold the building and the giant supermarket went up right there in the middle of Paris. A real sweet deal. 300 guys like me on minimum wage out in the street it was the building across from the Albatross, so Alexander used to come around. Far we look come into his eyes. Those bastards in suits. We're going to sell the albatross too. Then there was a fire and a trial. The whole shebang. He shakes his head in dismay. He's a good guy, a war vet. He was a doctor in the in Indochina. <gasps> oh ho, 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 ho. Oh, oh no. It, and simple as that. I think and Nita didn't do it because they wanted to sell the building and then it burned down. He was a doctor and a war vet and uh, the gun was World War II. Mm-hmm. Okay. He, he never told me, but with old guys you know how it is. They like to talk. They tell you everything. He folds out the Tupperware with the pungent orange rind cheese from Northern France. Would you like to try the Maroui? Uh, sure, why not? Don't poison me, please. He slices the cheese and carefully spreads it into a slice of bread. It's better with chicory coffee, then it really wakes you up. No thanks. You've never cared much for cheese and the smell is overpowering, but you give it a try. It's much milder and tastier than you expected. It's delicious. Alexander was traumatized by Indochina. When he came... Indochina or Indochina? Indochina, probably. When he came back, he was alright for a few years, but after he lost his license to practice medicine... I forget what they call that. If a caretaker stands up all at once the bowl and Tupperware container in his hands, he places them on a countertop near the sink and rifles through a pile of drying dishes. 
He grabs hold of something, but with a spoke you can't really see what it is. Alexandre, he told me that they'd be coming around asking questions. He said it was up to me to decide what to do. A change has come over his voice. It's softer, almost a whisper. Um, please don't kill me. Don't move. If I move now, maybe he, I will be more suspicious. So, don't move. He's an old man, the two of us. We speak the same language. We both grew up in the country. We moved to the city, thinking we'd get rich. And we ended up surrounded by a bunch of old geezers that are alive. Two of us, it's still left to his part. I am not... I, I'm not moving. No one messes with me. No one gives a damn about the cemetery caretaker. He turns around, a knife in his hand. Oh, great. I'm gonna die. We stand up almost without realizing it. Shut the door carefully when you leave. We don't want to let the dog out. Your heart is racing. A dog? You didn't notice any dogs. You hate dogs. His voice rings out one last time from the kitchen. I hope you like the maroir. A few steps more and almost as many breaths and you're out of the door and back in your cab. Shit, shit, shit. You turn the key in the ignition and hit the gas pedals. You start the cab and pull out, leaving the cemetery behind. The entrance gates disappear from the rearview mirror and your shaking stops. Mm-hmm, okay. Okay, well, I think I know who it is. Yeah, I did let Amelia take care of her problem herself. I Oh, yeah, that's true. I didn't show her pity. She didn't deserve any. Okay, so... That would point to Alexandra as the murderer again, but... As I said, why would it be in his interest to kill the journalist? It would also explain the tears, probably. Okay. So, Alexander was a doctor in the French army. Lost a medical license back in the 50s. Wait, what? Heard in your taxi the killer had a female voice pretending to be male? Okay, this is really tough. I don't know. So now what we heard is that they were actually before a sale of the Albatross building. Probably would have been a good thing for Anita. Because I suppose she would have wanted it too, so... It actually would have been a nuisance if her building burned down, wouldn't it? But then on the other hand, it's like she killed a reporter, she killed someone who she bribed before, she killed the potential arsonist. Did she kill the arsonist because she was really mad at him for setting fire to her house? Because then it would still make sense. With him, I'm thinking like the best evidence that we have is that he cried over victim two and three. Why would he know victim number one, though, if he's the suspected arsonist from the building? How would he know about that? How would he know that he's an arsonist? Because I don't think that he would just kill... that he would have just killed a random person. So he had to know that his first victim was assumed to be the killer of his grandson. I mean, with the whole doctor thing and so on, it, it would make sense because also the, like, the World War II weapon, which was used on us, he was in the French army. He was a doctor. Do doctors carry firearms in the army? I don't know. And he lost his medical license. But maybe because he lost his medical license, he also doesn't have access to this bromide pancuronium or something. This is tricky. But still, like, my biggest question on why he should be it is why did he kill a journalist? Why did he kill an honest journalist more than anything? Who? okay. But we are going to... Oh, uh -huh, you know who I'm gonna drive next. So we're gonna do this in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.